Welcome to the Modern Mythos Podcast, a show dedicated to the Call of Cthulhu role-playing game. I'm John Hook. And I'm Seth Skorkowski. Together we'll discuss writing, game mastering, and player tips, how you can apply them to your games of investigative horror. Awesome. Seth, what are we talking about today? Well, well today we're going to talk about um, some of our favorite modules and, and why. Just uh, kind of a list of just different ones that we've played over the years and, and you know, that we enjoy and why we enjoy them. Uh, as well as, you know, some different things like what might make us put aside a module, even if it is one that uh, might actually be a good one, but we decide not to play it for whatever reason or what changes we make to it or uh, how we might string them together into a campaign. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, favorite modules. Uh, you know, so I play a lot of Call of Cthulhu and uh, one that is a fairly new uh, scenario available in the Mansions of Madness book called The Code is a favorite of mine. I've run that thing five or six times now, I think, and it is always a blast. It is so much fun. Is that the one you've been teasing to run me through? Yeah, man, it okay. is. It's really, really good. It's a lot of fun. I've got it. I've never read it because by opportunity to ever get to play is so rare that like when I got the new Mansions of Madness, I like, flipped up and was like, oh, this one John wants me to just like flip past it as fast as possible to see what the next one is. Yep. So, yep. so please, God, don't spoil me now. Don't. No, nope, <laughs> nope. I'm not going to talk about it. I'm, I've I'm held just out. Saying it is one of my favorites. So we'll uh, we'll get that game on uh, our respective books on our calendars and, and get that going. I think that'd be a lot of fun. Um, you know what else? I I I I love a lot of classic uh, modules too, or at least you know from my perspective, I feel like they're you know classical. Um, uh, I loved playing superhero games. You know, I loved villains and vigilantes. I played the shit out of that when I was a kid. I just loved it. I um, I never pl I I never really did any superhero games, but uh, very recently I was going through. Um, uh, Designers and Dragons by uh, Shannon Appleclein. He talks a lot uh, about uh, villains and vigilantes and, and all of the early you know, RPGs and all that. It makes me want to play Bunnies and Burrows because I believe that was massively popular and I can't understand really how because it sounds so ridiculous. But... Um, great. <laughs> Well, and, and from my understanding, it was like at the time, it was like D and D, which was just war gaming where you had a character, but it was still really war gaming. And then all of a sudden this one came out where it's like, and now you're rabbits and you live in a field and you solve problems through friendship or whatever the hell bunnies and burrows is about. But it's like I, I wanna I wanna know what in the hell that game is like. Uh, I, I will as a quick aside, uh, legendary Tim Cask was a guest of honor at a convention uh, here in Kansas City. And uh, I was fortunate enough to uh, be able to get into a game with uh, Tim as the game master. And we all signed up thinking that we were playing uh, original D&D, &D, brown box D&D. &D. And, uh, and we had pre-gen characters the whole nine yards. And so... He says, um, I'm going to switch it up on you. Let me have all your character sheets. And he passed out brand new ones. And a bit, I guess we we all were polymorphed into mice. And he had this other, completely other game, loosely based on the uh, original od d rules. And we played as these mice, basically trying to make it across uh, a field from the farmhouse to some kind of a uh, mouse haven in the, in the cornfield. And there was rats and cats and birds and they were all, you know, harassing us and stuff in a, a rain barrel we had to get out of. And just, it was insane, but it was so much fun. And I never would have thought a game like that could have been fun, but it was. Secret of Nim D and D style. Exactly. Exactly. It was, it was awesome. Uh, so, Seth, let me ask you this. What would make you decide to run a published module as opposed to uh, creating something on your own? Well, uh, if I'm doing a campaign, you know, so we've got a, you know, characters that we're doing adventure to adventure to adventure. Uh, one of the first things I have to do is just does it work with the campaign that we're doing? 
you know, the, does it work with these characters that we have? Does this something that I could uh, easily work these characters into that story based off whatever their careers are, or interests are? Um, and then also just with the players, if, uh, if does it feel like something the players would, would enjoy? But as far as the module itself, I need it to feel unique in some way. You know, there, there has to be something about it that I, I can read and I can think, man, I wouldn't have come up with this on my own, or this does this way better than I would have come up with on my own. Um, if I read it and it's like, yeah, this is exactly how I would have written it. It doesn't excite me. You know, it's just like, eh. Um, and the other big thing is that it does it does excite me. It inspires me where all of a sudden, like it'll introduce something that's like, oh yeah, that's great. I can I can build on that scene that takes place in this building, or I can build on uh, these different aspects. Or if it goes sideways because the players just refuse to do the most obvious thing in the world, which is what they're supposed to do, and they just go running down rabbit holes. I'm like, oh, I can work with this, and I can. And so if it if it if I immediately start planning as I'm reading it because it's inspiring that creativity that's a pretty good sign that I'm going to want to run it. But um, it also just needs to be I don't know, like challenging for me and for the players, but in a good way. Uh, because if it's if I look at it and I think of it as just kind of ho-hum, sort of like if I could write this myself, I'm not going to put as much effort into it because I'm not going to feel that inspiration. And I'll, I'll, won't, I won't run it that well. So it has to at least challenge me in some good way. Um, and most of all, it just looks like it's fun. Uh, if I don't, if I don't think this looks like it's going to be a fun adventure, even if it looks like it's a brilliant adventure, I'm not going to run it. Uh, just because if if I have any reservations, I, I won't do it. Because you know, it's it's really difficult to schedule my friends and I all together. So I want to like always be confident that whatever we're going to do is going to be awesome. So if I'm not 100 percent confident, I won't I won't run it, and I'll just I'll pick something else. I got stacks and stacks of modules my, my two run pile is like decades long so it's not like i have a, a you know a shortage of ones to choose from how about, how about you you know it was interesting when i was uh, a kid we were not as dedicated to a campaign we weren't as dedicated to our characters we chose modules that we wanted to play because we wanted that experience of of having that module and 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 running, you know, and playing in that in that module, uh, and so if if a module came out and it was a high level module, we didn't set it aside and wait for our characters to elevate to a certain. Even if we only got close to the suggested uh, level, we would make brand new characters, and we had a whole character creation session where we, you know, kind of extrapolated and said, you know, what seems like fairly reasonable that you would have um, either acquired through previous adventuring or had commissioned or, you know, whatever. And, uh, and so we didn't make, um, we were trying to be conscious of, of, uh, of, of Mary suing, even though that term wasn't around, you know, we didn't want to, you know, completely overpower. Uh, but we, we tried to, to make, you know, believable characters and, and we would, you know, do these, uh, different, uh, D and D modules. Uh, so yeah, we were always interested in the experience of that module. Um, the only one, the only series that we really tried to, uh, have characters and level them up organically, which, uh, amazingly it didn't quite work out that way we were always behind the eight ball was the uh uh the g series d series and q1 i was right? just that's i went the exact same one with us queen of the yeah. demon web pits and against the giants you hell yeah can't you can't level up you can't kill enough things and collect enough loot to level up organically to that thing and so and by the time you make it through uh, the Giant series, which honestly, for most of the Giant series, it's Runaway. It's the Runaway series. It's just like, <laughs> no, I'm not doing that. I'm going to go the other way instead. And so nobody was collecting any uh, uh, experience. And uh, so by the time, if you just, you know, like if you're forcing your way through and you get to the to the drow, 
suddenly you're like, I'm not equipped for this, right? I'm under, <laughs> I'm underprepared for this. So uh, that was the only one that we really tried to, to be true to it. And, and just, it was a slaughter fest. I'm positive that my GM uh, or old dungeon masters, or our friend's dads who, who taught us how to play D and D that he nerfed the hell out of that thing for us. Because I, when, when I first started getting into to gaming, my mom at this garage sale scored this just massive lot of first edition stuff for 20 bucks, like two players, handbooks, two DMGs, you know, every single book. Um, and then like a stack of modules that was about nine inches thick. So I had most of the, the, the popular first edition modules and then a few weird obscure ones. So my GM would always just like, you have to promise you won't read it. And, I was so paranoid that if I did read it, like he would know. I I, th I think, yeah, like I had that disappointment. I didn't want Mr. Brown to be disappointed. So I didn't read it. But after we were done, I would flip through it and kind of see, you know, what all we missed, which since I was a little twink player at the time, I was like, man, what? I bet there's really sweet magic items that we missed, you know, and I can like go through it. And when you read how, how tough some of those monsters were, it's like, I don't, I don't think they were that tough when we fought him. Like, <laughs> I think he was kind of softening them for, for our, our, our delicate little egos because we should have probably gotten creamed a lot more than we did. Uh, so that was, that one was fun. I, I enjoyed that one. The whole mission to kill Loth was, was, was outstanding. Yeah. That was a really great series. Um, very inventive at the time and, and challenging. I loved it. So this is interesting. Uh, what would make you put aside a module? So why why wouldn't you run a module? One, why would you buy it if you didn't think you were going to run it, right? But if you did have it, what would make you read it and go, nah? Well, yeah, yeah, well, a lot of times we have like those the collections that come out, and I love collections because it feels like much less of a gamble if you pick up a book that's got four or five uh, scenarios in it. And now with PDFs, like they're so much cheaper, I guess, than they were. Uh, but you know, sometimes you'll, you'll pick one up. Um, if there is some sort of, of glaring hole or, or pet peeve. So with, with Call of Cthulhu Adventures, I have this, this one pet peeve. And it is, there has to be a way for the player characters to discover what in the hell is going on or, or why this is happening to, to some extent. And there's a lot of adventures where, you know, there's a monster and it's doing this thing. And then the GM section, it all lists it out very clear. And, the, and the, so the keeper knows why this is happening. But when you go through the adventure, there isn't any possible way the players or their characters could discover why this was remotely happening. And that, that always irritates me because e even in a movie or a story, the audience becomes aware. So a lot of the times I'll always suggest when I do my, my module reviews, like a journal or, or something like that, that the bad guy has. And if like, they find the journal, I can tell them. Um, so if it has to be explainable, if it's not, I, I sometimes put it aside. Um, it, it, when I talked about enjoyable, if certain things I don't think a player will enjoy, like I, I have one player who absolutely hates bookkeeping. And if, if it looks like it's going to have heavy bookkeeping, I won't do it because I know that he's, he's a CPA. He's playing his game, this game with us to get away from that aspect of his life. He doesn't want his, you know, happy imagination, fun time to pretty much be doing what he does in real life. So like that, that rules that out for him. Um, needlessly complicated, uh, which a lot of scenarios thankfully are, you know, aren't, but sometimes usually with uh, kind of indie ones or like Miskatonic repository or those, sometimes you will come across one that's just, I guess, a needlessly complicated plot. And I will often, if I can't streamline that down, I, I might not run it. Uh, my players are going to make even the simplest plot horrifically complicated because they will come up with whatever bizarre conspiracy theories they want to come up with. And I'm just sitting there the whole time going, it's, it's the Butler guys. It's really clearly the Butler and they're, they're, I don't know where the hell their ideas come from. So if the module itself seems to be 
overly complicated for no reason, then I might rule that one out. But um, I was just, if it doesn't seem challenging, like I talked about, if, if it doesn't inspire me in some way, or I think this might be kind of fun or a little difficult in some spots to run, it, I don't want to run it because I can like, well, I can do better than that. And it just doesn't inspire me. And I have tried to run them before when I'm like, I don't know, kind of coast through it. And they are always lackluster games. Just always, always, always. If I don't feel challenged, I, on some subconscious level, don't put throw my all into it. So I've just learned not to run them. Yeah, I've encountered... Um... Yeah, I'm a I'm a cover horror, and if I if I like a cover, I will probably buy the module. And oh, I have, I'm a sucker for good art, man. Like I'm oh, man. absolute so, yeah. sucker. And it is it is easy to uh, because I'm you know I don't have very high uh values. Yeah, you know, I love all art, uh, and so I see a cover, and if it if it's interesting to me, I'll, I'll pick it up. And there've been a couple of times um, with a couple of uh, uh, Call of Cthulhu, uh, like fifth and sixth edition era uh, modules would would come out and I would buy it and then I would start reading it. And I was like, man, this is just so poorly organized. I, I, I start being very critical about how I want to use that book as a tool for running the game. And if I can't find the information that I need in, in a, in a quickness, you know, so that I can have it readily available, it makes it to where I just don't want to run it. And I go into it a lot of times thinking I'm going to need to make a couple of changes or I, not that I need to, but maybe sometimes I want to just to mm. bring in a little bit uh, something different, a personal touch or something. But there have been modules that I've read and the organization and the really the immaturity of the writing has turned me off so much. I've just closed that thing. I've put it away and it's it's been in the next bin that went to uh, half price books to be turned in. I need to learn how to let go of certain ones. Like if, if, if I ever get rid of a, a RPG book, it is because I loaned it to somebody and they never returned it. Like I have never sold one off. I have duplicates of stuff. And that's like, I need to get rid of these spares. And then I'm like, I turn into like this freaking Smeagol. If I know they're precious to me. And like, so I've got <laughs> multiple copies of like uh, Madness in London town because on, I, I messed up on a Kickstarter reward where they were like, would you like to add some stuff? And I added one that I already had. So then it came in. I'm like, why the hell did I do that? And so like, I get two copies. I've had them for years. I've, I've thought about for, you know, it was like, I could sell this. I could eBay it. Hell, I could go to a con and just hand it to some random fan that recognizes me or something. But it, no, it will sit on my shelf next to the other one. I've played both. I've played it already, so I'm not probably ever going to play it again. So they'll just sit there next to each other till the day I die, and then they'll end up in a half price books. <laughs> my wife yeah. just <laughs> empties out my stuff. I will say there was there was a run with at least some of the older Call of Cthulhu collections that. I don't know, they just really weren't as impressive as I'd hoped they would be. Uh, when I first started getting into the game, I, I hit a home run, and I started with uh, Mansions of Madness. And that, uh -huh. to me, that was my very first collection of their stuff. I knew very little about the game. And I think just about every adventure in there is great. I haven't run them all. I, some of them I, I was never like excited about, but none mm -hmm. of them were bad and some of my very favorite ones come from there well then like i went back and there was like uh oh is it uh fatal experiments man i hunted for that one before i found it and when i finally got to read it i don't remember what it was but all i know is i read it and i was like huh and i never looked at it again like but i couldn't tell you like i, I just wiped it from my memory um but i had I had gone to yogsthought.com and I kind of like looked up, I was like, I want stuff that's got deep ones and stuff like that. And a lot of stuff kept pointing me there. So I was like, man, there's got to be some great adventures in there. And then I read it. It's like, no, oh, no, these just don't. There's something, there was something wrong with, with all of them that 
didn't make me put it on the list of like, I need to work it out where we can run this someday. And uh, it's just a, a, sometimes you do have those collections like, like uh, where all of them are good. Others where there's like one good one, one amazing gemstone. And uh, then you've got ones where it's like, wow, these are all just, they're not necessarily bad. They're just not anything to get excited about. Yep. Yep. Usually if it's a collection, it'll be mine, my scenario that's in that collection. <laughs> so I know exactly how to figure that one out. Oh, there's, look, there's mine. That's the weak one. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, there, there are good and, and bad scenarios out there. So it's, uh, it's obviously to taste, you know, people need to, to sift through and find what you like. Um, but I assume you, uh, will rework modules and put your own, uh, fingerprint on them. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, part of, part of it is I, I, I need to rework it to get it to fit into whatever our group is, but other times you read it and you're like, oh, I can do this better. I can, I can do this a, a lot cooler or, um, yeah, or just. I feel like doing it because it'd be fun. Or I know a player would really dig it if I added this little aspect to it. Because, you know, sometimes I will tweak it specifically for one of my players um, just to make them like it more. Uh, so then later on, they're like, oh, I love that thing. And I'll kind of feel like, yeah, I added that for you. You know, which, you know, I, I can't help but like take the credit. I, you know, otherwise, I should just nod and be all like, well, I'm glad you enjoyed it. I'm like, no, nah, man, I put that in there for you. So you better appreciate me. Because, you know, I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's probably not the best reaction I should have. I, I'm right there. I'm right there. I uh, We're going to talk about some of our uh, modules, uh, our favorite modules, and, and why we like them and anything that we've done. So I'm going to kind of save some of my comments for that. Uh, but I'm currently enjoying uh, running Spawn of Azathoth, that uh, one of the older campaigns from Chaosium. And uh, I'm Never in the midst it. of... Oh, it's... I'm really enjoying it. If you if you read it, you know, and try and run it as written, it is one of those modules where you're like, it's a little rough, and you know, some of the connections are thin, you know, to go from chapter to chapter. But I'm in the process of of just making updates to it as I as I run it, and uh, the players are having a I'm having a blast. It is just so much fun. So I, I want, I'll get more into Spawn of, that, of Azathoth in a little bit. So uh, spoilers on that. But actually, <laughs> I heard a rumor, Seth, that you have put together a Call of Cthulhu uh, campaign with your players, which I, I believe this campaign has already been completed. Sort That's of. Strung to, sort of. Sort of? Well, All right, so tell it's, us, it's, what, it's, what it's modules on did pause. you string together? We need to get back to it because my players will never forgive me if we end it. So, the, the and this was, it started Call of Cthulhu and we picked up 7th edition. Uh, some of these characters, like the very first 7th edition characters we made. And um, yeah, some, some passed, some that were not meant to last that long have become some of the most epic damn characters and they're still kicking. And mm -hmm. then we ended up converting to Pulp Cthulhu at one point, and we just took those same characters and we updated them to Pulp characters, and we've we've now pulped them out. So this, I, I get asked a lot whenever I'm doing my YouTube stuff of how did I work these together because they want me to tell them how they should do it, and it's like you can't because how I did it was so specific to exactly what we had in our group, and so the setup was I, I told him, uh, you will live in Arkham. I would, uh, I would like it if you had some money. Like I didn't, I didn't want, I didn't want like, we need money to be a thing. I didn't want money to be their motivator for, for anything. So I was like, I prefer it if you guys had some money, but that's not required. Or the uh, roadblock, right? I, yeah. I'm not a fan of hobo characters unless you're running a hobo scenario yes yeah, so, I, don't, I, I don't want the characters to go let me go panhandle for bus fare well if like the whole group is hobos and that's what it's about that could be awesome but otherwise it's like i'd like you guys to be uh pretty pretty well moneyed if possible i'd like you to have some link to academia because there's uh miskatonic right there or you could be detectives 
you know, or you could be journalists. Those are pretty much their kind of parameters. And uh, so what I ended up with, I eventually needed to give the war story on this. It was the most amazing coincidence. I had two characters that were both very well moneyed. Uh, one of them was uh, archaeology. The other was anthropology. And they both chose, at pure coincidence, they didn't roll these up together, the last name Swanson. So, <laughs> so the first game, uh, I, I had it where it was like this party of like some kind of big Arkham socialite. And he was very much stolen as the Duke de Richelieu character from uh, Devil Rides Out by Dennis Wheatley. And so you'd have this kind of like thing and who's who shows up. It's an astronomy party where they look at the stars and they talk about astronomy. But then after it's over and most of the people leave, they would sit around and they talk about astrology and it would bring into the occult and the mythos. And that's how they would, um, that's how the group formed is it was part of this rich guys kind of after party party. And uh, so there was like one guy whose whole goal in life was to have to add to the Swanson collection in the Miskatonic University Museum and his reputation. And the other was his super flighty uh, occultist cousin who just showed up to this thing one day. <laughs> and then there was a, a detective and, um, and a, a linguist professor. So you know, we, we, we did several adventures and we would often use some hook with the characters had where like, you know, we did a, um, what's it called? Cracked cooked mance because the person that was missing was a, f a former professor or somebody linked to the, the archeology span department. And since this character pretty much was, you know, this third generation Miskatonic of the Swanson family, he was really linked to the archeology span department. So he went to go investigate that. And we did that adventure. That's pretty much how we would use the angles for him. Well, then I did one day the, the Ilsley variant, Isley variant. I've never known how to pronounce that right. Me neither. I've run that one. And that one begins at a party. So we played for a while, but it's like, okay, the party is at your friend's house. This this well-to-do guy that's probably like a mythos, a Cthulhu mythos skill of 10, who kind of like is, is almost like your patron in some way. So they do the party at his house. Uh, they see the painting that kind of instigates the whole thing. And then, you know, they, they go down to Texas to, to Robert E. Howard's house and all that. And then they meet the villain and the villain's got this, uh, like this magic mirror. So when they're talking to the guy with the magic mirror, he talks about, he got that at this really great auction house in Austria. And uh, since I had these two characters that were, I, I think, the, the guy had a credit of 70 and hers was 65. Evidently, she wasn't the as rich of branch of this family fortune. <laughs> and, but they were really interested in, the, in that stuff. Well, then we wrapped that, that up. Now, then I then had a gap of another adventure in the middle. I think it was Born in Darkness. It's a, it's a mobster one. It was basically to get them a ton of money uh, as their rewards for that adventure before we did the next one, which was the auction. And their, their patron friend actually got the invite to go to Austria for the auction, and they were very interested in it. So he sent them off there with, with as kind of like to, to pick something up for him. And they did that, and they met all the NPCs. Um, I linked some of the NPCs that worked at the museums. Like there was a guy from the Smithsonian, and I don't remember if I added this or if it was in there. There was somebody from the British Museum there. And they, they got to know these NPCs. They did the job. One of the characters romantically involved with this like French psychic by the end of it. And he would occasionally pop up as this like romantic interest NPC later on. Well, then later on, uh, we go do uh, Madness in London Town, which is over something at the British Museum. And that was through their contact that they made at the auction. And I changed that one to where the British Museum had this uh, showing of, of Roman statues. Well, I said, well, they didn't, they didn't own all those statues. Of course, they had to get them on loan from other museums and the Miskatonic university museum just happens to have a really cool collection of certain Roman pieces. And they worked together with Miskatonic. Well, one of my characters who was the, uh, uh, linguist had died during the auction and his new character he brought in was a lawyer. 
And I figured that he was the lawyer that helped broker this deal between Miskatonic University and the British Museum, because once it was done at the British Museum, it was then going to come to America. It was going to be this whole trade thing that they were doing to make this a touring exhibit. And then the guy that was from the anthropology department who met their contact at the auction that so that's why they were at the initial showing of the Roman exhibit for Madness in London Town. So that eventually ends. They go back to the U.S. and just in time for Miskatonic to to reach out and say, "Hey, we've got this expedition that we're doing out in China, and this guy is doing some shady crap, and it's not working. And we got this lawyer PC here, basically who has to go serve him some some papers saying that we're firing him, and we need you as this representative of the archaeology department to go with him to China to basically." end whatever shenanigans this guy is doing. So they get on a boat and they go to China and that's how we did the Lost Expedition. And they get back from the Lost Expedition just in time for the British Museum's thing for Madness in London Town that exhibit is ending. So they actually have to go back to London. They have to wrap everything up and get it all ready to start transporting that to the US for its US tour of this exhibit. And while they were there, uh, it, it ended up, they went to, I think it was a psychic show or something. And that leads us to uh, Bad Moon Rising to where they end up like getting, it, it turns into Stargate. Like the British Navy takes them on this expedition and they go to the freaking moon and then they go forward in time and, and, and all of this. And then later th that ended up leading us into Armored Car where they had to work with the British military again, this time in Iraq, and they got to drive around in armored Rolls Royces and shoot machine guns out of the top. But it, it all just kind of worked. It was like, hey, it's your old friend from this or, or that, but uh, I probably wouldn't have been able to do it if I hadn't had, at one point I had a character die and he had a lawyer. So it's like, what the hell can I do with a lawyer? And I kind of fudged it around to get Madness in London Town going, but then Lost Expedition, which you wrote, uh, <laughs> came out and it was about serving papers pretty much as the key. It's like, well, hell yeah, I couldn't have made this up any better. <laughs> I was going for a super dynamic opening, right? <laughs> you have been served. And, um, but unless you had like a very specific type of setup, like I did, you wouldn't have been able to do that chain. Uh, so you know, people, people ask like, what order did you do? I was like, it works for me but that won't necessarily work for anyone else unless you happen to have this sort of setup. But I would change the modules in a way to foreshadow, like, you know, oh, I picked up this magic mirror at this auction house in Austria that you'll see two sessions from now, or there's a guy at this Austrian auction that is from the British Museum and he's a cool guy. Do you guys go have dinner one night? And yeah, then later on, he, he pops up. So I try to be a little ahead, like thinking forward of what adventures I want to run in the future. And when I do that, I then start kind of laying down some groundwork or some seeds in order to uh, most easily do that. Because otherwise, it'd be like, well, Bad Moon Rising takes place in England. I'm like, well, then do I just start off like, you guys are in England for some reason. And it sounds a lot better to be like, oh, you're going back to that, that, the exhibit's over, so you have to go pack everything up and inventory it and do all the legal paperwork for customs because you're about to load it on a boat and take that back to Arkham to set that us up for the beginning of its world tour. And all the players are like, oh yeah, I remember that. You know, they they do that because it all still relates back to this dude they had dinner with in Austria. So that's kind of how I linked them together, but it usually requires a little bit of foresight and, you know, Conveniently for me, one of our, our linguists uh, died in, in Austria and he brought me a lawyer as his next character. And it was like, oh, sweet. I can, I can work this in. Awesome. But that is awesome. And I think we did Madness in London Town was the first adventure after we converted to Pulp. So it was like Call of Cthulhu until that moment. And then when Madness in London Town started, our flighty rich occultist that believed she was psychic, which the player were like, I want her to think she's psychic, like, but she's not gonna be psychic. Oh no, no, she's, 
She's just one of those people that's like, oh, I feel the energies sort of thing. Well, then we did Pulp Cthulhu. She's like, holy shit, I really can feel the energies. <laughs> I have that talent. So it was it was real fun. But I say it just requires a little bit of foresight. And that's also why certain adventures, people say, oh, have you run that? And I'll say, no. I was like, why not? I couldn't work it into that chain as well as what I worked into it. So there were great adventures that I just never ran just because I couldn't work them in as smoothly. So mm-hmm. It's, you know, I'll, I'll get to them one day. One day I'll get to that massive stack of adventures that I deeply want to run, but haven't had a good opening. That I, I will say hands down, that is brilliant though. That was really awesome. And, uh, and to look at it from the, you know, just from the outside, those different scenarios seem so uh, dramatically different from each other that just the way that you stitched them uh, together is fantastic. So kudos to you on that. Oh, thank um, you. I felt I, like I was just drawing straws the whole time. <laughs> no, it sounds like it, you know, it's totally sounds like it was a win for you and the players. And that is all that really matters, obviously. But uh, yeah, I think, I think listeners will be able to do something similar, you know, just kind of take a look at what you have available and start thinking about the way, you know, your characters, the players that the, uh, the characters have or the, characters that the players have and how you can leverage off of those uh off those guys and their skills and stitch these together uh i don't have a story quite that entertaining although i do want to talk about uh spawn spawn of azathoth in in a minute but i wanted to kind of you know give a list if i if i could about some of my favorite modules and why uh, they are some of my favorites. So I've got four from uh, from a variety of interests that I have. Uh, so I'll start with uh, Death Duel with the Destroyers. This was uh, the first module published for Villains of Vigilantes. Uh, it was published in 1982, written and illustrated by Bill Willingham, who I freaking love, 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 love his art. Uh, and it is a really slim book. It's just 20 pages, but it is chock full of art. Not just uh, three by four space, you know, square. There are comic panels in here. The, the, the back cover is a full comic book panel. And then there's a couple of pages on the inside that are also comic book panels. And it's, uh, it's just really, really well put together um the the way that it was written uh bill did the writing as well he did a great job he he knows the genre of superheroes and he's able to get the players uh immediately into action because that's what you really want in a in a superhero book is in a superhero game is you want to be doing superhero stuff and events are well constructed to where there is a uh, a logical uh, escalation of power and threat, uh, and so it's just I think it's a really well written, very tight uh, module. I mean, it's like I said, twenty pages long, but if you were to take out all the art and collapse it in, it's probably only fifteen or sixteen pages. So. Uh, oh well, then if you take out maps, it's you know probably only twelve pages. So it it is a it's a just a really well designed uh, tight scenario. So I like that a lot. Death duel with the destroyers, an oldie but a goodie. I love that title. Oh yeah, and the 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 cover is just amazing. You know, again, uh, Bill oh. Willingham art. You know, and and this uh, I should I forgot to mention this this module it ties in with an actual comic book. At the time, Bill Willingham uh, started his uh, comic career with Comico doing the uh, the comic uh, elementals, and the very first super team of bad guys that the uh, that the elementals the good guys uh, did battle with were the Destroyers. Uh, and most of the destroyers from the comic book are represented in the uh, in the role playing game as well. One character uh, had her name changed, which was cool. Uh, she was much better as uh, Chrysalis than as the Iron Maiden. 
I later found out that there's a copyright with that title, so it can't be used. The band won't uh, allow anyone to use that. Uh, but Chrysalis is a much better uh, character title, and she she has a very interesting uh, history with her and her armor. But yeah, you can you can read these characters in the Elementals comic, and then you can also play them in the Villains of Vigilantes game. So super badass. I loved it. Next up. From classic D&D, uh, 1980, I freaking love S3 Expedition to the Barrier Peaks. Classic. If for nothing else, it is super gonzo. It's just a total gonzo sci-fi. I, I, put, I put chocolate in my peanut butter. I've got sci-fi in my fantasy. <laughs> and it is. it just, it doesn't make any sense, but it is so much fun. And the, I like it because it's, is a really well-designed sandbox. You're just there to explore. You're just there like, what was this thing? There was a, a star fell from the sky, crashed in the mountains. We should go find out what it is. And it's not a star, you know? <laughs> it's technology. Well, you know, if, if you listen to any of the stuff, with, you know, the, the old interviews and whatnot with Gygax, you, everybody always thought D&D was supposed to be Lord of the Rings. But he talked about he was always inspired by the old weird tales and stuff where they would blend fantasy and horror and sci-fi just at random. Uh, it just happened to be that Lord of the Rings was mega popular when it came out. So he was all like, yeah, we got hobbits too. But so I really think that Expedition to the Barrier Peaks or all of a sudden your your fighter picks up a laser gun and, and, and all that is kind of more of what he he wanted uh, of, of just classic. Yeah. It just goes crazy. Yeah, good one. Very good yeah, one. It's a, it's a good one. It, in, it is written by uh, Gary Gygax and his buddy Rob Kuntz. And the thing that is so awesome about this is I'm an art guy. It is chock full of art. The module has two booklets, and one of the booklets is only visual reference art numbered out so that if you get into a certain area of the ship, or you're encountering uh, certain creatures, it'll tell you, show your players handout seven. And you go and find handout seven, and there's that art in the book, and that's what you show them. It's amazing. It is absolutely amazing. Uh, so much Earl Otis artwork in it. So uh, just so much great art. Uh, and I and I love it. I love it because of that. You know, I. I you can just go and, and have a blast in it. So just silly fun. That's why I love uh, Expedition. And because I also love, still love sci-fi, uh, <laughs> I love the new Alien role-playing game from Free uh, Free League Press. Oh, it's and, beautiful. Uh, so good. You just recently talked about this on your, on your uh, uh, YouTube show, uh, Hope's Last Day. And it was so funny because I, you know, you know, peek behind the curtain. We have some notes about what we're going to be talking about. I had already written these notes before <laughs> I saw your uh, video, before your video had been released. And uh, so we we see eye to eye, I think, on uh, Hope's Last Day. It is also a great sandbox. There's no, other than the notion of you should try and find the key card in order to have access to a ship to get the, you know, get the hell out of Dodge. Out. Other they don't know that, exactly where it is. They know where it will likely be. Yep. Yep. And, you know, surprise, it's not at those places, but one of them will at least point them <laughs> to, to the yes. right place. But Yep. And they don't have to go to either one because they were given two choices of the two locations it could be. And, yeah, my only fault with that one is I wish it was longer. I, I want more of, so, of that one. So I've actually, I've expanded it. So I put a couple of other events in it. Um, I added a couple more NPCs uh, that can be quickly converted into player characters in case there's a death. Uh, I add a kid. So, uh, you know, kid is one of the occupations that you can have in the game that you don't see anybody playing kid. So I have it, a kid NPC. I, I guess it's not Newt a tragedy that they didn't have a kid in Hadley's Hope because the whole reason that kid is one of the archetype careers 
was because of Newt. Was because who of was Newt. from Hadley's Hope. Yep. So I do add a kid. Oh yeah. I I, I think it would be great to 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 bring one in there. Uh, just you could have so many different ways of doing survivors. I had, I, one of my characters died probably about 30 feet into Hadley's hope because they <laughs> forgot to turn on their, <laughs> their motion tracker and a face hugger just nailed them. And it was like, yeah, I'm not even going to have sympathy for you because your character is actually the one with the motion tracker. Uh, <laughs> one of the things I, I do this Hadley or hopes last day is one of those modules uh, similar to the code I've run hopes last day six or seven times I, I i've run it a lot and one image that i uh put into that scenario every time is uh kind of hearkening back to the original alien movie when uh parker and uh, brett are in the bowels of the ship they're supposed to be trying to fix the nostromo and there's uh white gas just venting in the halls right and you can't see anything, right? It, the the gas is venting so much it just obstructs visibility. So uh, when the characters are 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 going through Hadley's Hope, and of course it's it's ravaged with damage because you know aliens have been crawling through it while they've been gone. I have piping, you know, uh, venting piping that's been damaged, and so occasionally there'll be this sheet of white mist so you can't see past it but i'll have things like red emergency lights you know flashing back beyond that sheet and so as the characters are coming down the hallway even before their their motion tracker would be able to do anything within range they can look ahead down these long hallways and see this weird silhouette of the alien walking around because it's on the other side of the sheet of of gas and the the red strobe light is backlighting it the its silhouette on the on the the sheet you know so this curtain of gas and they just see it and go oh god i don't want to go that way and i just <laughs> the, i get the same reaction every time i get to describe that that uh, image so i love so it. much fun i love it so yeah hope's last day it's it's in the core the hardcover core book uh, for the alien role playing game, and it's totally well worth playing. And that was written by uh, Dave Semark. And then for Call of Cthulhu, my jam right now is Spawn of Azathoth. This was a campaign originally written in uh, 1986, and then they had a revised edition of it in 2005. It was written by uh, Keith Herber. And it's a big, uh, I was referencing the, uh, the 2005 soft cover book. Uh, it's uh, a 200 page book. I mean, it's a, it's a big campaign. It's got seven chapters and the nice thing about it is it's kind of a sandbox, uh, campaign in the sense that of the seven chapters, chapter one is the required opening, but it produces, uh, enough clues that you can uh, fan out into five other chapters in any order that you want uh, and just play with those different five chapters however you want to go. The Game Master keeps uh, Chapter 7 in their back pocket because there's an inciting event that triggers the beginning of Chapter 7. So the seventh chapter is the intended final chapter. And so... You know, you start them in chapter one, you let them explore the other five, however they feel like it. And, uh, you know, maybe you don't worry about doing all five. You know, maybe you wait until they've only done three or four, and then you, you know, go ahead and do the inciting event and then let them go straight to the end, you know, and they can skip a chapter or two. But oh, that sounds cool. It, it is. Uh, it, but Doc Herber was a very imaginative writer and a very skilled writer. But there, it's you can see that there are some parts of Spawn of Azathoth that are weaker and uh, don't uh, work, especially with uh, today's more experienced uh, role players in the in the environment that we live in. So you know, I made I've been making changes to Spawn of Azathoth that my players don't even realize that that I've made these changes. 
but they're just loving the hell out of it. Uh, in chapter one, there's really supposed to be this one event that, that you do. And then through the course of that event, you collect a bunch of clues that could lead you to the other chapters. But I added uh, one of the NPCs, instead of him just being just basically a dirtbag uh, funeral director, uh, mortician, um, I made him a, he's also transforming into a ghoul. Okay. Um, and, and that there was a scene where, uh, cause one of my players, he wanted to have a character and, and I'm not sure if you've, uh, used this yet in your Call of Cthulhu seventh edition games, but, um, there are some optional rules where you can do different packages like a war package. Oh yeah. Or, yeah. So one of the packages is called a, is called a mythos package. And one of my players wanted to have the Mythos package as part of his character background. And he said, I want my character to have basically, without us playing through it, I want him to have had the uh, experience of Paper Chase. Oh, yeah. He wanted he wanted Paper Chase to be in his, basically in his backpack. I said, great. So he has this uh, phobia of ghouls. And he was all alone in the funeral home and he, they were going to try and question the uh, the the funeral director and i had him come from the back room and he had a weird kind of lope to his uh, to his movement uh like a, almost like a limp uh but he was like i don't really like that lope and then he was asking questions and he was like the funeral director said oh yeah i have that paperwork let me go back in the back to get it so he turns around to leave and he and he has like a little bit of a meeping chuckle to him as he's you know chuckling to himself but meeping as he's going away and and uh, the player goes is he out of sight did he go into the back room i go yeah he goes i leave uh, and, there, <laughs> and there was a the buddy was waiting in the car outside and he goes hey uh, you're back early he goes just just drive J just drive now <laughs> you know and they they they've been talking about we should go back and kill that that mortician yeah no, I don't want to do that. I'm not going to go see. They they don't know a thing about this guy except they suspect that he's a ghoul. But you know, with Paper Chase, that it's got a friendly ghoul. Like it yeah, does. Like, it has if, a friendly ghoul, but he wanted to have this negative uh, experience. It, one of the things I liked about Paper Chase, other than it's it's a one on one game, and there's I I, I always love seeing more one on one games, but is the the, the best way to complete that is to talk to the monster and then the monster is like nice and is reasonable and you can you, you kind of end with a relationship uh with them so yeah so i was like it's, it's a ghoul it's like i was like i was wondering it's like is he gonna be all like hey brother do you happen to know my friend who reads a lot of books <laughs> like yep no, he's he apparently wanted to have his character have a a phobia about the ghouls a fear of them and uh, and it didn't help that the scripted encounter conflict in chapter one is this uh, one character who, while he himself is not turning into a ghoul, he has uh, learned a spell to extend his own life. And to do that, he has to consume brains. And so... He's been feeding on monkey brains, but then when a buddy of his, the uh, the the inciting event for the entire campaign, a buddy of his died, or he thought he died. He was just basically like in a in a coma or something. He sliced the top of his friend's head off and was in the act of eating his brain when his buddy woke up. And was like, "No, you're killing me!" And then he had to kill him. And so you know they they're like. And they finally figure out that, you know, oh, that dude, he was, uh, he was eating brains. Maybe he's a ghoul too. And they're in on it together, you know? So they're, they're just totally free. But the Spawn of Azathoth uh, has very few flaws. I've been having so much fun in uh, personalizing it for the players, for my experience and, you know, and uh, modernizing it to Call of Cthulhu 7th edition. Um, uh, yeah, we're just having a blast. I mean, they've been to the Dreamlands already, and there's a whole there's a lot of variety in uh, different uh, uh, 
challenges and adversaries that you would encounter in this uh, campaign, which I think is that should be a staple in a campaign. You shouldn't be going through seven chapters of the same type of villain over and over again. Oh, no, there needs to be so- some so repetitive and so boring. You need to have variety. Because uh, even if already- the players find that fun, if I find that boring as the GM, the game's going to suck. If I yeah. find it, if yeah. I find it boring, it's over. So yeah, I have to have that diversity of just this chapter. We're doing something weirdly different than the previous. It, while in the dreamlands, uh, if I can just aside for a sec, while in the dreamlands, they discovered uh, the spirit form of the character, their, their friend who died in chapter one, which was the whole inciting event for the campaign. Get, get, getting his brains ate. Yeah, getting his brains ate. So they find his spirit form in the dreamlands and he's being tortured and all this. It's just horrible. And uh, and so they they save his dream form and they had had this other encounter with a, basically a, a god. And it was this god was being very cryptic and said something about bring a sacrifice and he can restore the, uh, the dead friend. And so they didn't really want to wait or try and find somebody else to sacrifice. So one of the player characters says, I'll do it. He somehow, I don't know. I guess he thought maybe the, the dead friend would just be restored somehow. But I was like, you do this, right? He goes, I totally do it. I said, okay, well, you're dead, (laughs) but your new character is the uh, guy who died at the very beginning. So now here's your new character. And he was like, what and it was a lot of fun uh so they they were very they all the players were caught by surprise that that this one character died and like he was dead 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 but now he's the other guy that that was dead but now he's wearing the face of the other dude you know so it's really fun wow what kind of modules do you like well uh well i i too chose four following your example so first go back to the old AD and D first edition, uh, Sinister Secret of Salt Marsh from 1981, Dave Brown and Don Turnbull, which is from TSR UK. And I have always loved this adventure. And it it it, it actually surprised me later on. Uh, fifth edition actually ended up reprinting it. And I had it was never like one of the super popular ones that a lot of people had all all read. And so I thought it was like one of my secrets, like like that nobody knew about this, but me. And then I found out later on, it was really popular. And it's a, it's a haunted house adventure for first level characters. Um, When I was love haunted house games, but it's also got that Scooby-Doo aspect of it's not really haunted. uh, It's people, but it's perfect for first level, which at at the time, most of the adventures that were getting printed always seemed to start at third level or fifth level. And if you got one that was for first level, they were always so lame because first level characters and, and, and one E were so fragile. And there was, so there really wasn't anything for them, but this one was perfect. It was challenging, but didn't feel like it was treating them like they were made of glass. It was like, it was just absolutely perfect. You could drop it into just about any world setting. You know, it didn't have to be in some, particular location except for it's a house on a cliff overlooking some water uh so i've i've done that was on a great lake or on an ocean i've run that module or just blatantly ripped that module off so many times over the years that's awesome very versatile packed with art but what i loved about it is like unlike a lot of other ones where you go to the dungeon and there's no role play well, like there's role play here. Like you, you, you meet this dude who's a prisoner, whose whose name is Ned, and then he's an assassin against you. And it ends up that the people that sent you on the mission, some of them are actually with the bad guys. And then there's this political aspect of basically they're arming all the lizard people that are doing stuff. And then it rolls into directly into a second adventure where you have to go raid a pirate ship. So it's like two two separate adventures that are woven together in this really short uh, module. So I absolutely love that one. Uh, But I also think, I don't know how much of of some modules that I love is because they were necessarily wonderful or they were what I needed at that time to show me a different way 
of, of, of running the games. And that is especially true with my, my next one. And this was for uh, Cyberpunk 2020, released by uh, Atlas Games, and it is an adventure called Thicker Than Blood. Uh, Allison Brooks, 1993. We had played Cyberpunk 2020 for years, and almost all of our games were you are stealing something, you're sent to kill somebody, you know, or you are protecting something. They were pretty much all heists, or they were dungeon crawls up skyscrapers instead of down into dungeons. And this one was an investigation. And it was the first time I had ever read a, a well done investigative adventure. Uh, you know, outside of like, I'd only ever read any for D&D and none of them were really that good. But Cyberpunk being a, a skill based game, skill based, I just think is better for investigative games. It, it used skills that we had never thought about using, ways to play that we had never thought about. Uh, it is absolutely packed with tips on like, okay, if your if your players miss this clue, or if your players are become, you know, don't want to work with the fixer for this job, it was it had all those little kind of sidebar tips, which I always appreciate in modules if there's like a little sidebar that's basically like, hey, FYI, in, in case this happens, here's like a couple ideas to help you through it, which being my first real investigative adventure, I really needed some of those tips because had I not basically had that warning beforehand, at least think about, I, I might have sunk that game myself by accident, not knowing how to respond to whatever it was that they did. Um, it had this layered plot where like you do the investigation and it's an interesting investigation, but then when it's done, your client basically hire some assassins to kill you because you're the loose ends because the investigation was to cover her screw up. And then you have to discover who your employer is because you never actually knew who your employer was. It was just a terribly mysterious woman. And it was just so much fun. But when we got done playing that, my group and I, who had all played Cyberpunk for a while, and that was my first actual adventure, that like pre-written adventure that I ever ran for him, we all played differently because this actually taught us how to play that particular game because we were just kind of left our own devices and did it like it was D&D when this showed us it was so much more. So is it a great adventure by itself? I don't know, but it was absolutely influential on me and it was absolutely what I needed at that time and what we all needed at that time. Um, the next one, another one that I love, and it surprises me that it is not more loved uh, by other people. Actually, I found out that most people seem to hate this adventure. <laughs> and that is Mansion of Madness, which appears in Mansions of Madness. <laughs> I has always found it really unfortunate that that what has almost got the same name as the book. And uh, that was uh, Fred Berndt. Berndt? I... I don't know how to pronounce that. And with a last name like mine, I'm always apologetic if I can't pronounce the last name <laughs> correctly. <laughs> it was short. Yeah, you know, actually, before this, I had somehow in my head convinced myself it was probably twice as long as this, but it's just 25 pages with art and everything. And it's a three act mystery where when we ran it, each act was exactly one session. Oh, wow. It was absolutely perfect where like each act was like, Wow, we ended it exactly on time. And I didn't have to rush it at the end. It just naturally worked out that way, um, which doesn't happen. Uh, it had this kind of unpredictable investigation where, you know, classic Call of Cthulhu, you need to find the missing person. And then it turns into this plot where you've got these two like mythos cultist wizards that are having a battle with each other. And there's this a lesser known mythos entity that's kind of kind of caught between them. Um, and a lot of great backdrops, you know, there's the University Museum classics, you know, uh, a, a danky little speakeasy down by the docks uh, you go to. And then like you hop in a car and you have to go out to like Pennsylvania to a farmhouse <laughs> out there. And then you come back and then you end up going to a mansion, which yeah, like you go through the whole thing. It's like there's not a mansion in it till like the very end of the of the third act um, that you end up doing it. That's the only way it ended up in that book. They might have added it just so they could get it in that sweet upcoming <laughs> book. Um, Fred, is there any way you can add a mansion to what you got here? 
What is my genius? Fine, fine. I'll put a mansion in it. Um, the other thing I like about it is, uh, I bet surely Mansions of Madness was my first Call of Cthulhu like pack of adventures that I ever read. It, this adventure out of those is the darkest hands down. It is actually still one of the darkest Call of Cthulhu adventures I have ever read. It is one that gave my players the the, the true on heeb jeebs, and there is a, a seed there where the evil wizard is basically breeding women with bugs, and he's <laughs> raising all these these bugs. Well, the, the module talks about there's a room that's called the nursery, and there's the young bug monsters in there. There's never a description of what these things look like. I always kind of found that unfortunate. So what I made them look like is they had these uh, chitinous faces that looked like porcelain doll faces and the mandibles kind of came out of the mouth and they were all scuttling around in this room. Well, as they were growing older and molting, like pieces of shell would fall off, including these like perfect porcelain doll faces that were like made out of, of chitin. Well, when they opened the door and these things came springing out at them, uh, that's when I found out that my wife has a deep down true hatred of, of uh, bugs. I also made them cry <laughs> and, and coo like babies. So when they were coming at them, they were giving baby giggles and, <laughs> and, and little baby noises. Oh my God. And, and so my players were like, Oh God, like they're standing up because I gave them such the heap juice. I, I ended up adding all that. And if you if you end up reading my Valdigan series and you get to my third novel, Ibenus, you will notice something very similar about my baby faced monsters that are up there. <laughs> <laughs> because the 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 added effect of the the baby sounds, I think, was really what did it. Um but then you go to another room. They there's basically three rooms of horror, and they chose at random the doors, and each one of them escalated, including like a, a woman, she's about to give birth to these insects, she's had her hands and feet cut off, and she's tied to this bed, and she's insane. And when the PCs start talking to her, the, that gets her so excited and maddened that she gives birth, and these things just come bursting out of her. It was oh, it's such a fun adventure. And uh, huge hit. My players talk about it still to this day. And it was like years later, I started reading reviews and I get to that one. And it was like so adamantly hated by so many reviewers. And I'm like, man, this is like my favorite. <laughs> like, oh, I got to read it now. Uh, I, just, I, I love it. But uh, part of it was also just they did it exactly the way that it was fun. Like we never got frustrated. It was everyone was in the mood at the right time. I had so much fun with that adventure and uh, I always recommend it, but it also have to like, okay, this, it doesn't have 18 plus, like this is the darker shade of darkness, but it's the darker shade of darkness. Just <laughs> And um, my fourth and final one is uh, for Traveler. And this one feels like a cheat, but it's, it's Murder on Arcturus Station by J. Andrew Keith from 1983. Uh, so Traveler, the classic sci-fi RPG from like 1977, a uh, very uh, space opera and whatnot. And this is a murder mystery that happens on a space station. And uh, it is not like most conventional scenarios because it doesn't tell you who did it. It's a toolbox to help you as the game master determine who did it. So you get these, these nine suspects. Each suspect has a solid alibi or a solid motivation why they want the person to die. Uh, then it presents uh, two different ways they could have done it. Like, you know, like this is how they did it that night by stabbing him or shooting him or blowing up with a bomb or whatnot. Or here's the third option, which is their alibi. If they actually were innocent. So the GM decides who did the murder. And then you actually, then they determine how all of the suspects feel about each other. So like you could have suspects like, they're really eager to work with the PCs to, to help them out or others that are difficult to work with or ones that falsely accuse others or ones that figured out who the killer is and they're going to try to blackmail the killer. And then the killer's got their own random things they could do, like they frame someone else for it and they plant false information. So it's this toolbox where you have this massively replayable adventure and it is very well written. Uh, so I, I found this game, I ran it, I loved it. 
And then I reached out to Mongoose Publishing, who's now publishing Traveler. And I was like, hey, guys, this is one of the most badass adventures I've ever read. And it's highly imaginative. It's been out of print for years. And that is how I ended up heading the project for the, the Mongoose republishing of it is I, I loved it so much. I reached out to them and said, you have to bring this back. And they said, well, are you agreeing to make all the modifications? I said, hell yes, I will do it. Uh, so, <laughs> but the reason I got on that project wasn't because they asked me to, it's because I Snyder cut it. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Them into it. So I, I love that one. Uh, a lot because it's such a cool twist and toolbox uh, that you can always make it because you don't have to use all nine suspects. James could use seven or five or however they want to do it, but it also teaches them how they could write a mystery. And I really like that it's a brilliant mystery game in a system that's not known for murder mysteries. You know, if it's a Call of Cthulhu murder mystery, it's like, well, that makes sense. It's Call of Cthulhu, but this was Traveler which is mostly about stealing spaceships and, you know, shooting laser guns. And then just because I, when you said like, come up with your favorite modules, I had to like pin these down. A couple of runners up is the original Ravenloft, mm. uh, massively influential, brilliant, brilliant adventure. Yeah. Uh, the, the map of Ravenloft, the isometric map has always just blown me away. Uh, all That Glitters by TSR UK. That's another obscure one. Uh, I've always loved that one. Uh, where like, it starts off, you're in a jungle with this little map that's all torn up, like at the beginning of Indiana Jones. And then you end up in a magic subway that shoots through the mountains like Stargate. And then you're in a desert adventure. Fun, fun adventure. And then uh, Pax Cthuliana by Two Starving Knolls, which is system neutral, but it, it's... It, it's called a Cthulhu, but it's a system neutral one. Uh, really, you could go through it with almost no rolls at all. And it's very based off of uh, music for dramatic timing. Like it actually has a, you know, you should get songs, these specific songs. And at this scene, you play the song, they have to have it solved by the time the song ends or the bad thing happens. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. and, and like there are like certain soundtrack songs where they actually have this build up and mood. Oh, the first time I read it, I was like, this is going to be really weird. I don't know if this would work. And it was such a screaming hit with us that like I started like preaching it like a madman on the mountain. Like you have got to play Pax Cthuliana and you have to get the exact songs it tells you to get because, oh my God, it was perfect. Mm -hmm. um, so highly recommend that to Starving Knowles. But, but those are mine. Um, I said some of them, I don't know if, how, if they were actually amazing modules or if they were just amazing for me at the time. Which that's awesome. Yeah, I I'm right there with you. There there are there are times where you and your players are just in the right space to receive a certain module, and that's what's going to make it perfect for you. You know, doesn't have to be masks of Nyarlathotep, which you know is a seminal campaign. Uh, sometimes it can just be the code, you know, <laughs> and it's yeah. awesome. It's so good. Awesome. Well, I think we might be good, Seth. So, listen, listeners, we can't do this show alone. We wanted to thank our amazing editors, Max Mahatha and Edwin Nagy, for their hard work and keen skills in making us sound awesome. I also want to thank John Sumro for making our badass logo. He's an extremely talented artist, so uh, you can follow him on Facebook. Uh, check out his official website, and please consider joining his Patreon account. We'll stick links down in the show notes. But uh, but John has done a, a wonderful job with our logo, and we are very excited about trying just to support him. Oh, absolutely. John is amazing. Uh, also, we want to thank the amazing band, The Darkest of the Hillside Thickets, for generously allowing us to use their song, Gluttony, as our intro and outro music. If you are a fan of Lovecraft's writing and the Call of Cthulhu role-playing game, then please, you need to check out the Darkest of the Hillside Thickets. Uh, check out their Bandcamp site and check out their official band website, both of which links will be in the show notes. Thanks for listening. <laughs>